the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Hey, we're going to get into the word of the Lord tonight. God has a message for you. Never go to church to hear from a man. Never go to church to hear from a woman. It's not about hearing from a man, from the young, the old, from the black, the white, the brown, the yellow, from the red, or any other color you could imagine. But this is about us coming together and hearing from God. This is about hearing from the Holy Spirit, who is the teacher of the church. So would you join me in reverencing the Lord? I'm going to get down on my knees. If you would, stand to your feet. And let's go before the Lord together in prayer and invite the Holy Spirit to come and to be our teacher. Father, we come to you tonight in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful for your presence already in this place. What a joy it is to be in your presence, to praise you and to worship you, God. And Lord, we thank you for that time that we've already had. God, we don't want to just stop there, Lord. We want to go further with you. We want to go deeper. God, I pray that as we open up your word tonight, that Holy Spirit, you would come and be our teacher, be our guide. Open us up to receive the word. May we have eyes that see, ears that hear. Hearts that are ready to receive with good understanding the word that you are going to plant in our hearts tonight. May it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives, God. Father, we pray that you give us the vision, the wisdom, the guidance, the direction, the motivation to do all that you've called us to do and be all that you've called us to be. And Lord, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. Father, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we would ask it upon all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, we love them. We thank you for them, God, and pray that you would bless them as you bless us tonight, God. And Lord, we're in agreement, and we say out loud, amen. amen. You can have a seat. Get your Bible out. Go with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 3. Very familiar verse in Ephesians chapter number 3. Some of you guys already know where we're going. But tonight I want to talk to you about the God who is able. Our God is able. In case you didn't know that coming in here tonight, our God is is able. Now, I could camp right there and preach on that all night, but God has got something that he wants to take you to and take you through, because if he can get it in you, he can get it through you. See, God doesn't want to just fill us up and puff us up. No, God wants to pour into our lives so that we can pour out into our lives and into the lives of others. And our God is able, able to do what? Well, whatever he wants to do, he's God. I mean, come on, let's talk for a second. This is the God who breathes and planets exists. This is the God who speaks and creates systems. This is the God who can lay down and trace out an image of a man out of the dust, breathe into it, and cause it to become a living being. Our God is able. This amazing God, this God of the universe, this God of the macro as well as the God of the micro. The God who created the atomic structure, the God who holds everything together. You know, they still don't know what holds atoms together. They call it atomic glue. I, I, I got news for the people who created that term. I got another name. His name is Jesus. And the Bible says that he holds everything together by the power of his word, and therefore our God is able. He is a God who is strong. He is a God who is mighty. He is a God who is powerful. He is a God who can do whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do it, however he wants to do it. Our God is able. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Some of you guys knew I was going there, didn't you? Yep. Holy Spirit speaking to us today. Paul writes under the influence of the Holy Spirit, the inspired word of God. Now to him, capital H, speaking of God, who is What? Oh, come on, I know there's more than three of you in here tonight. Now our God, now to him who is what? Able. Able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works where? In us. In us. See, if you're born in the Spirit of God, now that God who is able, that God who can do whatever he wants to do, whenever he wants to do, however he wants to do, now that same God, same creator of the heavens and the earth, same creator of you and I, the one who knit us together in our mother's womb, that same God now comes and lives on the inside of us. That God who is able now is inside of you and I, lives inside of our hearts. Now, this is an overwhelming understanding. But take a look at the verse again because there's some things I want to draw out of it for a moment. Now, to him who is able, we know God is able. We know God can do it. But he's able to do exceedingly. That means far beyond. Abundantly, that means there's a whole mess of it. 
Can, can, we, can we use a San Bernardino term? It's just a mess of what God, God can do as much. God can do abundantly. Look at this. Above all that we ask or think. That means that the ability of God is greater than our ability to ask. Did you get a hold of that? That means you can never ask too much. Why? Because your God is able. No, oh, I, don't, I don't think you got it yet. I said you can never ask too much. No, 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 no. Uh-uh. No, no, no. You still didn't get it. You still didn't get it. You know why you didn't get it? Same reason why I didn't get it. You want to know why? Because we don't ask. You're laughing because it's true. Listen, when's the last time you got in the face of God and said, God, I'm asking bigger, I'm asking better, God, I'm asking greater, God, I'm asking for the world, God, I'm asking for, for, for just crazy, loco, God, I'm asking for, 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 for just a mess and abundance. Come on, somebody. When's the last time you asked like that? Problem is we don't. We don't have a problem with that God is able. We say, is God willing? Does God want to? And we cop out of stuff and we say, well, maybe it's not God's will. Listen, it is God's will. Why? Because he's able. And, 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 and if God is able, then whatever is according to his will, uh, the book of 1 John tells us that if we ask, if it's according to his will, whatever we ask, I said whatever we ask, we have those things that we've asked of him. So that means that you can never out-ask the ability of God as long as you're in his will. Hello. I know God wants you healed. Why? Because he healed people in the Bible and he's no respecter of persons. Therefore, if he healed them, he not only is able to heal me, he wants to heal me. Problem might be that I'm not asking. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask. I know God wants you blessed. Why? Because Father Abraham was blessing. And now when I go in Christ Jesus, I am now a partaker of the blessing of Abraham, according to my Bible and your Bible. And therefore, the problem might be that I haven't asked big enough yet. It's time to start asking bigger, church. Why? Because you're never going to out-ask the ability of God. Oh, what about this one? What about this one? Or think. Oh, hello. That means that the perception I have of what God is able to do will always be too small. Think about it for a second. Can God save your family? Is he able to do that? What about your neighborhood? What about the Inland Empire? What about California? What about the United States? What about our world? Come on, that's still too small for our God. I still don't think you guys are getting a hold of this. I don't know. I don't know. Able in the Bible means inherent power. God has the power within himself to do it. God is also willing, as we know. If God did it in the Bible, we can believe for it and we can receive it. So the problem is not... God's ability. The problem is not his willingness. No, because he is willing. So then the problem is something in us. We must ask the question, how do we get power and willingness working together to produce action? Did you guys follow that? We've got to get power and willingness working together to create action. Action. On whose part? On God's part. Right? Because he's able He's willing, he wants to move, he wants to do. Okay, so, so what is our part? In other words, if God has so much ability, then why doesn't he do it? Ah, I'm glad you asked the question. Matthew chapter 9, please. Matthew chapter number 9. Matthew chapter number 9, verse number 27. Jesus is traveling. 
going and doing great works, healing the sick. His fame's going out. Matthew chapter 9, verse 27, when Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. Now, they are using the covenant name of Jesus Christ here, Son of David, right? Because they knew that the Messiah would be through the line, the lineage of David, because a king would be set up and his throne would reign forever. So here they are. And they know that that's God's covenant with the house of David. So they use a covenant name. And, and that means that they knew their word. And they recognized Jesus. So they follow him and they're crying out and they say, Son of David, have mercy. Have mercy. We don't deserve this. We can't earn it. We're blind. We can't do anything about it. Have mercy on us. Verse 28, when he had come into the house... The blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Now look at verse 29. Then he touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, let it be to you. Verse number 30, first part, and their eyes were open. Wow. So that means that it wasn't the crying out. That means it wasn't them getting outside of themselves and going and shouting, crying out, looking foolish, even though that was the vehicle. It wasn't the fact that they knew the word just alone, that they knew that Jesus Christ was the son of David and that they used the system, the covenant name. That wasn't enough. It, it, it wasn't just the willingness and the ability. There had to be something that enacted the power, and that was their faith. Are you, do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, according to your faith, be it unto you. So that means for you and I, let's break it down to us. This God who is able, that if we're going to receive the ability, the power of God, if we're going to get that power going, why? Because it's resident on the inside of us. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, according to the power that works in us. The same Jesus that touched those eyes and opened them up. The same Jesus who spoke and planets existed. The same Jesus now lives on the inside of you and I. Therefore, the ability of God lives on the inside of us. And therefore, you and I have to not just know about his ability, not just believe in his ability in himself, not just know he's willing, but also we have to believe. We have to receive it by faith. A couple of things tonight that I want to take you through because God is able, I can. This is what we can do. Because God is able, I can. A couple of things. We're going to complete this sentence a couple of times tonight. And I believe that as we go through these things, you're going to be encouraged. You're going to see yourself. You're going to see how the ability of God can take you through. You're going to see your situation. You're going to see your family. You're going to see your kids, your husband or wife. You're going to see your business, your finances. You're going to see your neighborhood and the people that you're reaching out to. And God is going to get his finger in some areas of your life and say, not only can I, but if you will believe me, church, you will receive the power in these areas. Are you ready? Yes. All right. Praise God. Because God is able... I can, number one, make it through. Because God is able, I can make it through. Through what? Through what? Well, trials, yes. How about this one? Tribulations? Oh, yeah. We can make it through that. Why? God is able. How about this one? Temptations. Oh, my. We can make it through temptation. You don't have to sin. You don't have to be stuck. It doesn't have to be like a tar pit that you get wrapped up in and you can never get out. No, why? Because our God is able to get you through. Here's one for somebody tonight. Because God is able, I can make it through. Through what? Through today. Some of you guys might have come into this church service tonight wanting to end it all. Didn't know if you were going to make it through today. But listen, our God is able. And whoever that's for, I want you to realize and recognize that if you will tap into Jesus, if you will give him all your heart and life and invest everything you have into him, our God is able and you can believe him for great things. You can make it through today. You can make it through tomorrow. You can make it through life. Our God is able. You can make it through. There was three guys, three young men 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Here they are, and the king has made a command. He's made an, an image of himself. He's conceited. He's arrogant. He believes he is the thing, right? So he makes an image of himself, and he has everybody else bow down before this image of him. He's mad. He's crazy. And so these three young men, three young Hebrews, decide that they're not going to fear the king's command. No, they're going to fear God. God said, you shall worship no idol, right? You shall not make any graven image. Don't bow down to it. You shall have no other gods before me. Therefore, they said, we're going to fear God. We're going to hold on to the word of God. And they knew that the consequences of not bowing down to this statue, to this idol, was death. So now these three young men are about to be thrown into a fiery furnace for not worshiping the idol. And the king starts to say, now what are you going to do? What do you say about this? Are you going to bow down or are you going to burn? And this is how they respond to the king. They say, we don't even need to defend ourselves before you, king. We, we don't got to say nothing. Now, Daniel chapter 3, verse number 17. Here they are speaking to the king. They say, if that's the case, if that's the case, if you're going to throw us in the furnace, if that's the case, look at what they say. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. They go on to say, even if he doesn't, it doesn't matter. We're still not bowing down in the next verse. But look at what they said. If that's the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. Didn't matter what fiery trial was ahead of them. Didn't matter what tribulation awaited them. Didn't matter the pain that they were going to have to endure. They so believed God that even if they died, they didn't care. They still, still weren't bowing down. But they had such a conviction, such a strength of character that they said, our God is able to deliver us. Now, you know the rest of the story. They heated up. The king was so raging mad. He heated the furnace up seven times hotter. The guys that were standing next to the furnace, they died because it was so hot. They threw the young man in. The ropes burned off of them. And they started walking around. All of a sudden, there wasn't just three guys in there. There was all of a sudden a fourth man. And, and, and he, looked like, he looked like an angel of God. He looked like the son of God in his appearance. And, and the king cried out, come out here. And they came out, and they didn't even smell like smoke. Our God is able to deliver us. Listen, if God can deliver these three young men from a fiery furnace... In the natural. If he can deliver them from being burnt, what can God do in your life? What can God do with your husband or wife? What can God do with your kids? What can God do with your workplace? What can God do with your home? What can God do with your dreams? What can God do with your visions? Listen, there are people in here who have a God dream on the inside of them. And trouble and trial and tribulation has raised its ugly head and tried you to get off of it. Tried to make you quit. But listen, our God is able. And he will deliver you. Some of you said, I just want to live a Christian life. All I want, I don't have dreams and visions. I'm just trying to get a hold of this thing. I'm new. And why is the devil picking on me? Well, listen, because he hates your guts. <laughs> and sometimes people say, but he didn't hate me before I was a Christian. Oh, yes, he did. He was playing you. <laughs> but now that you're a Christian, you've gone and made him mad. And so he's after you. But God is able to deliver you from the devil, able to deliver you from ungodly people. God's able to deliver you from world systems that have been set up to make you fail, to make you fall, to drag you down, to get you to get off this thing, to get you to quit. God is able to deliver you from all that. Amen. Amen. A great verse in Hebrews you know where Hebrews is. Turn there with me. Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter number 2. Verse number 18. Speaking of Jesus. It says, for in that he himself has suffered, being tempted. He is able to aid those who are tempted. Wow, that means that when you go through a trial, when you go through tribulation, when you go through temptation and you cry out to God, 
that God doesn't just go, oh, I'm just able. No, God says, I've been there, and I've done that. The, the word in the King James is a word I don't even know if I can pronounce right. It's secure, okay, something like that. Really what it means is that God is able to minister to on the level of your need. Think about Jesus coming and sitting down next to you, putting his arm around you and encouraging you. Lifting your head up, wiping your tears away, letting you know I've been there. I've experienced pain. I've had people turn their back on me. I've been beat up. I've been torn down. I've had, I've had everybody leave and I was the only one left. Jesus knows what that's like. He knows what suffering's like. He knows what loss is like. Think about it. We were just talking about them saying Hosanna as Jesus came into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry. One week later, the same people that are saying, come and save us, are now saying, crucify him. Jesus knows what pain and rejection and suffering and, and, and all that stuff is like. Jesus was tempted in all ways as we are, yet was without sin. So Jesus is able to come and to give aid, to help, to minister to you and I at the point of our need. Can you give God a praise? Our God is able. Our God is able. So, first thing for tonight, because God is able, I can, number one, Make it through. Because our God is able, I can, number two, trust in his promise. I can trust in his promise. Why? Because God's able to deliver. I I don't know if Pizza Hut's going to deliver the pizza in 30 minutes or less. But I do know my God. And I do know he's able to deliver his promise. I I, I don't know if Morgan Stanley or Merrill Lynch or or any of those big Fortune 500 companies can provide an increasing return on my investment. I don't know about all that stuff, but I do know that my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. That's a promise. I don't know if the doctors can do anything for me. I don't know if the drugs or the medication that they're giving me is going to help, but I do know that my God is able to heal my body, and by his stripes, I was healed. My God is able. He's able to deliver on his promise. If you turn with me to the book of 2 Chronicles, there in the Old Testament, if you find kings, go, go, go forward to Chronicles in your Bible. 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles, and we're going to be in chapter number 25. And there was a king over Judah. Now, there was, you know, Israel was, was divided at this time. There was two, two divisions, two kingdoms. Northern tribes was called Israel. The southern tribes of Judah and Benjamin were, were, were called Judah. And they had a king named Amaziah. Amaziah, the Bible says, did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, but he didn't have a loyal heart. Didn't, didn't. Stick with God. Now, remember, we're talking about the promise of God, that God is able, and therefore we can trust in his promise. So, so this guy, Amaziah, who, who did what was right before God, but, but didn't have a loyal heart, he knew the word, and he did what the word said. See, his father was assassinated, basically. And he took all the conspirators, he took all the men that killed his father, and he put them to death. He executed them all. But... He did not do as the custom of that day, which would be to kill all their children too, because they may raise up, they may grow up and take revenge on him. So what he did was, he had read the word. He had read what the Bible calls the book of the law, the book of Moses. And in the book of Moses, it says that you shall not punish the children for the sins of the fathers. And so he executed all of the men that executed his father, but he didn't touch their sons. See, he knew the word. And he did what was right before God, and yet he didn't have a loyal heart. Remember, we're talking about promises. So he had a a surface-level relationship because he knew the law, but he didn't understand the heart of God behind the law. Becomes king, he starts to number his army. Finds out he has 300,000 men who can carry a, a, a shield and who can use a spear. So he doesn't think that that's great enough. 300,000 men. Not a big enough army for him. So what he does is he goes out and he hires 100,000 mighty men. Are you there in 2 Chronicles chapter 25? Okay, verse number 6. 2 Chronicles chapter number 25, starting in verse 6. We'll read through verse number 
2 Chronicles 25, verse 6 says, He also hired 100,000 mighty men of valor from Israel for 100 talents of silver. So he goes out to Israel. Israel was their brethren. Israel was the nation above them. Even though it was another kingdom, it was still part of the nation of Israel. They were still brethren. They knew that they came from the same family lines. However, Israel never had a godly king over them for the whole time that they were a nation. So for him to go and trust in the strength of a wicked king's men meant that he had his heart in the wrong place. Meant that even though he had read the law, even though he knew the word, he didn't understand that the same God who was able to deliver the nation of Israel from the hand of Egypt could deliver him no matter how big his army was. So now he's trusting in man's ability, hiring 100,000 men, rather than trusting in God's ability and going after what God says. Verse number seven, but a man of God came to him, saying, O king, do not let the army of Israel go with you, for the Lord is not with Israel, not with any of the children of Ephraim. Verse number eight, but if you go, be gone. In other words, he says, if you're going to do what you're going to do, go do what you're going to do. Just get on out of here, right? If you're going to if you're going to go, be gone. Be strong in battle, even so, God shall make you fall before the enemy. He said, "You can fight all you want. I'm not going to do you a bit of good because God's not with Israel." God shall make you fall before the enemy. For God has the power. He's able. Look at this. To help and to overthrow. God has the power. He's able. He's able to do what? He's either able to help or he's able to overthrow. You choose. So be it to you according to your faith. What do you believe about God? Are you trusting in God's ability? Are you trusting in the God who can open the blind eyes? Are you trusting in the God who can send somebody fishing and they can pull out a fish with a coin in its mouth? Or are you trusting in the government, trusting in your education, trusting in your friends and your family, your neighbors? What are you trusting in? Take a look at what happens. Verse number nine, then Amaziah said to the man of God, but what shall we do about the hundred talents which I had given to the troops of Israel? In other words, he says, I've already invested my money. I'm on the line for this. What am I going to do about that, man of God? I've already spent the money and I can't get it back. Now look at what the man of God says to him. This is amazing. Absolutely amazing. What shall I do about the hundred talents which I've given to the troops of Israel? And the man of God answered, the Lord is able to give you much more than this. Wow. Wow. Sometimes we, we're afraid to follow God. We're afraid to throw away the CD that we bought because it's ungodly. Listen, God can give you much better music. God can give you more money to buy new CDs. Well, we're afraid I already bought the movie ticket and now I found out that it's rated R and there's nudity in it and all sorts of profanity, all sorts of perversity. I guess I better go watch it because I don't want to lose my money. Listen, that's foolishness. God is able to give you the 10, 20, 50, whatever a movie costs these days. Sometimes we say, but I, I, I've already messed up. I've already spent money. I've already invested in this area. Listen, God is able to give you much more than that. I've already invested time. I built up all this stuff. I got the job. I went after it. I rearranged my schedule. Listen, God is not a God who's concerned about time. God redeems the time. God creates time. Listen, if God can take King Nebuchadnezzar, raise him up to the level he was at, speak the word to him, after he rejects it, make him like a wild donkey out there in the wilderness where his hair is matted and looks like the feathers of an eagle. His fingernails grow out. You say, what are you talking about, Pastor Dan? Read the book of Daniel, okay? Because it's in there. This man was crazy, bonkers, nuts, mad. He, he was sleeping under the stars. And in one day, God restored all of his thinking to him and the entire kingdom to him. If God can do that, then what are we concerned about with our life? What are we concerned about with our five bucks? What are we concerned about when it comes to our money or our time? Listen, God isn't concerned with that. God is concerned with us trusting and believing that he's able to deliver on his promise. We need to stay loyal to God. Money and time don't matter to God. If we believe God, 
then we'll receive the promise. I wish the story ended right there where the man of God said the Lord, of, the Lord is able to do much more than this. And, 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 you know, if you read on, Amaziah dismissed the troops of Israel. And they were mad at him. They did not like it. They were angry that he dismissed him. But he said, I don't care. And he goes out and he wins a great victory. Why? Because God's able to help. And God's able to overthrow. And so God gave them a great victory. I mean, they were, they were overthrowing the enemy. They were throwing them off the side of a cliff. They were doing all this great exploits. They plundered this nation. I wish it stayed there, but remember, he didn't have a loyal heart. Next thing Amaziah does is he starts bowing down to the gods of the enemy that he just defeated. Listen, if we have a loyal heart and believe God and trust God that that which he promised, that God will deliver it to us, then we will receive the promise in our life. We need to have a loyal heart before God. Why? Because God is able. Yes, we got to stick with God. we got to stay with God. Just like Abraham. You know, we mentioned Abraham. But think about Abraham. Abraham had money. He had wealth. He had all that stuff, but he didn't care. Why? Because he went before God. He said, God, who am I going to give all this stuff to? I don't have a child. And one born in my house, one of my servants is my heir, God. Am I going to give everything that you've given to me to somebody who's not of my own family? See, in those days, your children were your heritage. They were the ones that you passed everything on to. And if you didn't have a child specifically a male child to carry on the name, you had nothing. It was all for nothing. It was going to get passed on to somebody else. And so God says, no, that guy born in your house is not going to be your heir. You're going to have a child. Ten years go by. Abraham can't have kids. His wife, Sarah, can't have kids. And yet, look at what it says in Romans chapter number 4, verse number 21, and being fully convinced... That what he, God, capital H, had promised, he was also able to perform. And you and I know that a Abraham and Sarah had Isaac. And the miracle child, the miracle baby, they received the promise. They received the promise. Because God is able, I can, number one, make it through. Number two, I can trust in his promise. Why? Because God's able to deliver. Last thing for tonight. Are you guys still with me? Yeah. Praise God. Last thing for tonight. Because God is able, I can face tomorrow. Face tomorrow. We have hope like no one else has hope. Why? Because tomorrow will always be better than today with Jesus. Every day that we live, good day, bad day, doesn't matter. It's one day closer to Jesus. One day closer to his return or to our home going. We know that because of Jesus, because he lives, because he stands at the right hand of the Father on my behalf, because he is there in that place of authority, in that position of power, I can face tomorrow. Doesn't matter what happens to me here on the earth, you can take the world, just give me Jesus. I can face tomorrow. I don't care what you do to me here on the earth. I don't care what you do to this physical body or any of the physical stuff. Why? Because my hope is not in the stuff. My hope is in Jesus. I was thinking about this today. Don't ever let the circumstances of today get you off of trusting God for tomorrow. Let me say that again. Don't ever let the circumstances of today get you off of trusting God for tomorrow tomorrow if you lose your hope you're gonna lose it all a young man named Alan I was uh, working in a youth group in San Diego a young man named Alan came in and he was a great guy one of those guys that everybody wanted to be around he was hanging out good guy part of the the, the leadership team eventually and we, we raised him up into being a, a small group leader ministering to others Alan got into college and start, started getting into psychology, started getting into all this, these, these different doctrines, these different teachings. Now, I don't have a problem with going to college and getting educated, but I do have a problem when, when you lose your focus and when you lose your hope. And it turned out he started believing the lie and started believing that there was no God, there was no hope, there was no future, there was only the here and now, there was only the natural, there was only this uh, uh, psychological thing, and he lost his hope. And I get a message that Alan ended his life in a hotel room by himself. Why? Because he lost his hope. He got his eyes off Jesus and he put his eyes on the natural and on the here and now. Listen, church, it doesn't have to be that way. If you hold on to Jesus, 
If you follow him wholeheartedly, if you look to Jesus, he is the author. Yes, he started it all, but he's also the finisher. He's the one who can complete it. And the Bible says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of his coming. 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. There in the New Testament, 2 Timothy. In the first chapter. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse number 12. Paul the apostle, he's writing from prison. He knows that pretty soon he's going to be executed. He knows pretty soon he's going to go and be with the Lord Jesus Christ. He's giving his last thoughts to Timothy, his final exhortations. Here in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 12, he says, For this reason I also suffer these things. Anybody who tells you that when you become a Christian there will be no pain, no sorrow, no suffering, don't sign up. <laughs> My Bible says all who want to live a godly life, all who want to live a godly life, all who want to live a godly life, in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. You wonder why you became a Christian and, and it seems like the stuff hit the fan, it's because it did. All of a sudden the devil is raging mad that he lost you. Your friends and family don't understand. The world systems are against you and, and, and God is looking to say, hey, look to me, child, look right here. Keep your eyes fixed on me. You can do it, why? Because I'm able. You can make it through. Why? Because I'm able. I've got promises for you. You can trust in the promise. Why? Because I'm able. For this reason, I also suffer these things. There's a reason why we suffer through. There's a reason why we go through pain and trials and problems and pressures and tribulations and temptations. There's a reason why we can endure these things. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. You can hold your head high, Christian. I used to feel so ashamed because I had messed up. I used to feel so ashamed when I said the wrong thing or did the wrong thing. I used to feel so ashamed, and all of a sudden I got so much freedom. When, when one night I was just talking to my wife, and I said, you know, I just messed up. And I realized it's okay. Why? Because God's not finished with any of us yet. Why? Because God is able why? Because the trial I'm going through today is not the trial I'm going to be going through tomorrow. That God takes us from glory to glory. That God, that God is, is leading me on a path. And just because I'm going through a problem doesn't mean that I'm a sinner at that point. It's when I start to sin that I become the sinner. Hello. But just because you're going through a hard time, don't be ashamed of the hard time. Don't be ashamed if you don't have enough money. Don't be ashamed if you don't have enough faith. Don't be ashamed if you don't know the word that well. You're not educated. Maybe you're not smart. You don't look like everybody else. Don't be ashamed of that. Why? Because God is able. God can take you to a new level. God's able to give you whatever it is you have need of. Start somewhere. Sometimes people say, I only got a little bit of faith. Listen, Jesus was only looking for a little mustard seed faith. You have that kind of faith, you can move mountains. God doesn't require us to be the spiritual, supernatural giants. He is the spiritual, supernatural giant. He's the one that's able. We just got to trust him, believe him, hold on to him, look to him. For this reason, I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. For I know, everybody say, I know. I know. For I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed to him until that day. In other words, think of it like this in our modern day society. We put a whole lot of stock in people. We put a whole lot of stock in companies. We put a whole lot of stock in other things. And all those things fail us. But when we put everything, when we put all the chips on the table, when we say, God, I'm going all in. God, I'm leaving nothing behind. I'm holding nothing back, Lord. I'm trusting in you. And when you know you're God, you know that he's able to keep what you've committed to him for that day. Oh, we, we, wait, wait, wait. We had a 401k. Where'd that go? We, we had retirement built up. Where'd that go? We, we had investments. Oh, land, you, 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 you never go wrong with real estate, right? <laughs> Hello. Stock market, no. Investments, no. Government, no. Wait, friends and family, well, they were around when I had money. Now they're not around anymore. I don't know why. 
Oh, see, people come, people go. See, stuff comes in and through our lives. But the one thing that's not changing, his name is Jesus. You can trust him. He'll keep what you've committed to him. So what have you committed to him? If it's all your heart and all your life, he'll keep it until that day. Notice, put the verse back up on the overhead, please. Thank you. Until that day. Notice there's a capital D on the word day. You know what that means? When you see that in the Bible, that means the day, right? There is a day when Jesus comes back and it gets a capital D on it. And that is the day that he's talking about. In other words, if you lose everything here on this earth, but if you've entrusted your life to Jesus, that whether you pass away before he comes or whether you're still standing when he comes, when that day comes, he's got what you've entrusted to him. He said, no one can snatch him out of my hand. Last verse for tonight, the book right before the book of Revelation. You go to the back of the Bible, find the maps, hit Revelation, and then go back to this little teeny tiny book called Jude. Jude. There's no chapters in Jude. Sometimes it says Jude chapter 1. That's the only chapter. That's okay. So whether you say Jude 1 or Jude and the verse, you'll get there. Jude verse 24. Now to him who is able. Able to do what? Keep you. Keep you from what? Keep you from stumbling. And to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Listen, we've all walked a road in our life. We've all been places some of us have been around the block. Some of us got hit with the block. <laughs> Even if you own the block. It doesn't matter what you've done. It matters where you're going. Jesus, him who is able to keep you from stumbling. See, we're going to go through trials. We're going to go through pressures. We're going to go through problems in life. But God is able. Able to do what? Keep us from stumbling. And to present you faultless. Listen, I got a lot of faults. I am at fault in a lot of ways. A lot of times. I mess up. But, but because of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, he's able to present me faultless. He, he washes me with his blood and those faults go away and I can stand in his presence. Before the presence of his glory with exceeding Joy. See, God doesn't want you having a humbug Christian life. Even though it's tough, even though it's pressure, even though it's hard, you should be able to go through it with a smile on your face. Why? Because you trust him. Why? Because you're going to make it. Why? Because he's promised, and I can trust in his promise. Why? Because I can face tomorrow. If you got something from the word of the Lord today, come on, give him a great big praise. <laughs> Woo! Hallelujah! I want to talk to some of you guys before we leave. We've had a great time tonight. We've sang. We've worshiped God. Had a wonderful time in the Word. I believe you guys really got something. Thank you for, for being so wonderful and letting me preach and just enjoying the Word together. You guys were great. Let's not stop there. I want to make sure that your heart is right with God because the Bible says that God is able to save to the uttermost. He's able. But that doesn't happen because you're good. Nowhere in the Bible say you can be good enough. That because you're good, you're saved, and you're going to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. It doesn't say that because you're good, you get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. You can't be good enough. There's no, no grading scale, no curve in the Bible. You've got to be above that line that gets you into heaven. If you think you're going to get to heaven just by being good, let me love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. You need to listen up. Some of you might think, well, you know, I'm saved and I get to go to heaven because I was raised in church. Parents took me to church as a child, called me a Christian. I, I'm, I'm saved because, you know, they, they hung a cross or a St. Christopher around my neck growing up. Had me baptized or christened as a child. Maybe they took you to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class. Maybe even Sabbath school class. And you're born in America. America's a Christian nation. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you get to go to heaven because you're raised in church and parents tell you you're a Christian. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere. Check it out. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, go to religious classes, 
that you get to go to heaven. I don't see anywhere in the Bible. Check it out. Nowhere. Nowhere in the Bible say that because you're born in America that guarantees your citizenship in heaven. It doesn't work like that. How foolish. And yet a lot of people think that way. And again, nowhere in the Bible do I see that God's looking at your life and saying, well, they're not any other religions. Therefore, they must be a Christian. He lumps you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. It does not work like that. Sometimes people say, well, you know, but I, I not only went to church when I was a child. Here I am sitting in church tonight, Pastor. I mean, here I am in front of you. That's great. Glad you're here. But could, could you show that to me in the Bible? Where you sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you Christian. It doesn't work like that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, sit in church service, call yourself a Christian, that makes you Christian. Any more than you can go to the ocean, sit in the water, call yourself a fish, and that makes you a fish. You're just a wet human sitting in the water. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. It doesn't work like that. Some of you might be thinking, well, okay, I, I got you on that. I understand that, but my last church, I got involved. I didn't just sit there. I, I did stuff. I helped out. I carried the pastor's Bible. made decisions. People thought of me as a leader in that church. I, I even taught in the Bible classes and got a membership card to that church. That's great. Once again, glad you did those things. But could, could you show that to me in the Bible? Where you help out, get involved, sing in the choir, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader, that you get to go to heaven. Could you show that to me? It's not there. And nowhere in the Bible say that because people think of you as a leader or you teach in the Bible classes or you get a membership card to a church that God is waiting for your membership card when you enter the gates of heaven. I'm not taking anything with you. That's how you think you're going to get to heaven. I love you enough tonight to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. And if you were to die tonight, you wouldn't make it to heaven, but you would end up in hell. Some of you say, but wait, wait, wait. I know God. I know about Jesus. I know about Easter and the resurrection. I know that God is able like you were preaching tonight. I even said amen. I, I know who God is. I could tell you stories from the Old and the New Testaments and quote scriptures to you. That's great. Show that to me in the Bible where you know God. That gets you into heaven. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible shows us the devil himself knows who Jesus is can quote scriptures. We see the devil quoting scriptures in the Bible, but that doesn't make him a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. This is not about some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God. But rather, this is about your heart. God's always been after your heart. Beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, God is looking for your heart. Remember, we were talking about the king whose heart was not loyal to God. He's looking for all of your heart and all of your life. Let me prove it to you. In the book of Revelation, Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, sometimes people say, well, what does that mean, lukewarm? Well, here's what it means. It means a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Well, because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. Jesus made a statement to a religious leader of his day by the name of Nicodemus. Now, this man, Nicodemus, was a good guy, did good things. He was raised up in his church from the time he was a child. He, he, he attended. He eventually got involved. He helped out. He, he, he made decisions. Pretty soon he was one of the teachers now. He was telling other people about God. We would have thought if anybody was headed for heaven, it would be this guy, Nicodemus. And yet when Jesus speaks to this great man, he doesn't pat him on the back and say, Nick, man, keep doing what you're doing. I'll see you in heaven. No, he doesn't say that at all. What does he say? He says, Nicodemus, you want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You must be born again. Plain and simple. You must be born again. Now, I know our society's made a mockery out of that. This is not about what society says. This is about the Bible. What does the Bible say about being born again? Well, it's always meant the same thing. Born, being born again means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. If you haven't done that, I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not saved and you're not going to make it to heaven. And if you were to die tonight, you'd end up in hell. But it doesn't have to be that way. I'm gonna give you an opportunity tonight. In a moment, I'm gonna go just like this. Count to three. One, two, three, and pop my hands together when I say three, just like this. Bang! 
When you hear the sound of my hands popping together just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, whoa, time out. You had me right up until you were going to point and count. I'll be embarrassed if you point at me and count. Uh Uh-huh. You might be, but get over it. Why? Because think of this. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Come on, tonight, you can get right with God in this safe and friendly place. Probably won't even be embarrassed, but even if you are, it's better than ending up in hell. Listen, if Jesus can go to a cross, beaten, bloody, open spectacle, you can raise your hand in this safe and friendly church service. Probably won't even be embarrassed. And we want you to do this. We're excited for you. People around you, man, they brought you here for a reason if they brought you. They want you to do this. So don't be afraid. Come on. Just get ready to get your hands up. Now, who should raise their hand in a moment? You've been running from God instead of to God. I'm speaking to you. If you've never done this, never given God all your heart, never given God all your life, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight. Don't leave the same way you came in. Make sure. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in this place, you know that's the condition of your heart. Then you need to get right with God in this safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, or if you're watching by television in the foyer, the Love Rock Cafe, or you're watching the live stream, hey, God is watching. You can lift your hand right where you're at. If you're on campus, you can either tell an usher or come into the church service. Or if you're watching the live stream, you can click the blue button that says respond to God, and then Pastor Jim will show up and lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. I'm gonna count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Get ready to get your hands up wherever you're at. If that's you, you need to get right with God. Come on. I'm going to pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment. Here we go. All together. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Raise them up high. Thank you. There's one, two, three. Thank you. There's four. Thank you. God bless you. There's four wise people already up on top. Or is that back in the family room? Where are they at? I don't see them. Where are they at? We've got four wise people already. Waving over here. Oh, gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Anybody else real quick? There's five wise people already. Six. Thank you. Gotcha. Thank you. Seven. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? There's eight. Gotcha. Nine up front. Thank you. Ten. Eleven. Thank you. Twelve. Gotcha. Up in that family room. Is that one back there? Twelve. Thirteen. Is there another one back there? Fourteen. Is there a fifteen back in there? Do I hear sixteen? Praise God. There's about fourteen or fifteen wise people. Where are you at? Where are you at? Where are you at? Come on, thank you, gotcha, 16, 17, 18, thank you. Up on top, 19, thank you, God bless you. Oh, don't you just feel number 20? Number 20, where are you at? Come on, just, there. I got, I got them up there, I got them, that's number 19. Praise God, where's number 20 at? Number 20, you're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Yeah, you should, you should. In the foyer, two in the, 20 and 21 in the foyer. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Now, all 21 of you, if you're number 22, number 23, number 24, number 25, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Hey, you haven't missed out yet. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to gather your stuff. Coat, purse, sweater, Bible, a friend if you need a friend. I want you to get your stuff, get a friend if you need a friend, get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that till we get you down here, okay? So if that's you, you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand. Get your stuff, get a friend if you need a friend, get in the aisle and meet us up front. You come right now. Come on. Come on. Won't you come just as They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. Oh. From the foyer, the come on down. Won't you come From the family room so you can bring your kids. You come on. Are. You can come too. Come and see. Come Hallelujah. Come on. See. Come on, come on. They're still come coming. They're still coming. We'll wait for you. You can come right now. If you need to come, you just come. He'll give you life everlasting. All right, all right. And strength for today. Okay, everybody up front. Hey, look up here. Look up here for a second. Put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. Came to give God all your heart and all your life. Came 
to be born again, all right? That's what's going to happen. I want to introduce you guys to a friend of mine right over here to my right, your left. This is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. Nothing weird's going to go on. You know, you go to church sometimes, you wonder if they're weird. Uh, I, I'm about as weird as it gets tonight, all right? Pastor Dave's cool, all right? Nothing strange's going to go on. He's going to do three things. I'll let you know what they are in advance, okay? First thing he's going to do right off the bat is pray with you, a simple prayer to invite Jesus into your heart, okay? He'll go slow, and this is about your heart. God doesn't come into your heart because you need him. He went to the cross and died for you because you, you need him. Now he comes into your heart when you invite him. So be it to you according to your faith, okay? You're believing God now, and you're going to receive him into your heart. You're going to be born again, okay? Second thing he's going to do is give you some free stuff, all right? Everybody loves free stuff. We love giving away free stuff. So that's a pretty good relationship already. We got a couple little booklets our pastors wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. They're real thin. They're simple reading. And I would encourage you, sit down and invest a half hour and read through that little booklet. Find out what to do next in your walk with God. Listen, if you can invest two Two and a half hours into a blockbuster movie, you can invest a half hour to sit down and read and find out what to do next in your walk with God. Last thing, last thing he's going to do, he's going to give you a friend. Yeah, that's what I said, a friend. Basically, what we do is we give away friends here at The Rock. We call them spiritual personal trainers. Heard of a physical trainer at the gym, helps you get strong, helps you get buff, all that kind of stuff, right? Okay, spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. They'll, they'll help you to find out how to get strong in the ways of the Lord. Basically, they'll encourage you like a good friend should. You know, your friends in the world, they're going to take you back to the world. But a friend in church will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord and help you keep coming back to church. That's what an SPT is all about, a spiritual personal trainer. He'll tell you how it works, and then I'll let you come right back out into the church service, okay? So if you guys will make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah.